Good day. My name is John Duho, and I'm the principal consultant for Starboard Enterprises. I'm also the current president of the CSEG, otherwise known as the Canadian Society of Exploration Geophysicists. I'm going to give you a presentation or an e-lecture on the analytical approach to hydraulic fracturing and induced seismicity monitoring. What this e-lecture is going to outline, I'll give you an introduction to the general topic. I'm going to talk about induced seismicity concerns. And then I'm going to start to introduce you to the decision tree analysis approach. It's basically a checklist of items that you need to, you need to pay attention to if you're going to go out and monitor or not monitor uh, on some of your seismic uh, or oil field operations. I'm going to also show you two specific examples from Canada, and then I'll wrap it up with a summary of what you need to pay attention to for the future. To monitor or not to monitor, that is the question. Fracking or wastewater injection can cause earthquakes. Well, yeah, this uh, Arthur's uh, uh, quite an uh, established uh, individual from the USGS. As Dr. Dave Eaton says, Tens of thousands of wells have been stimulated with hydraulic fracturing in Western Canada. Less than half a percent are associated with induced earthquake activity. It means the other 98% or 99.5% don't cause any, any fracking of any concern. So the background involved in part of this introduction is what, what is the main issue involving over induced seismicity? It's the public concern over induced, induced seismicity, but the public is really concerned about invaded potable groundwater, and that's what would affect their livelihood directly, and, and we do understand that. The trouble is, is the, a lot of these expectations, a lot of the issues that come out are false expectations appearing real, otherwise known as fear. This is happening all over the world. Uh, there, as the slides indicate, there were fears in Quebec about uh, what fracking is going to cause. There was the Macondo blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, not really due to fracking, but due to oil and gas activity that creates bigger fears. There are fears in Europe and other countries in England and, and France to do with uh, hydraulic fracturing. Again, false expectations appearing real. And the movie called Gasland just exasperated the situation on what fracking has actually caused uh, and what it can cause. And it really came down to people worried about their groundwater and their livelihood being impacted by it, whether you lived in a city or a farmer and that would impact your, your, uh, your, your family. A uh, person that was quoted in a, in a paper after watching Gasland says, as I, as I show in this current slide, I'm convinced that fracking is now among the top environmental catastrophes facing the country. And it's worse than the uh, nuclear disaster that occurred in Japan at about that time. Well, it's not really that, that bad. And I'm going to show you things that you can do to help deal with the public in the future. And that is induced seismicity monitoring on your properties as you go forward. And let's take it at the highest enough level. There's still an issue between oil and gas companies and the general public. And that is what you could call, we, we, we frack the trust between the general public and what people are perceiving. So how do we get through that trust? Well, we'll start to show you some data that we acquire. Uh, we'll start to show you what you can help to uh, address and, and support your public license to explore for and, uh, and produce hydrocarbons in anywhere on the planet for that matter. In this example from the West Pembina area in Alberta in Canada, I'm showing you a, an earlier slide that was put out by a company uh, called Schlumberger, and it shows what we would show to our industry uh, friends what fracking is about. And you can see there's a, a line that runs between the surface and the subsurface, and that, that the fracking events or micro seismic events are occurring in the subsurface and you can see on the surface the the trucks and the borehole uh, and the information that would head out to head office uh, when the well was fracturing what is not clear is that that is actually not just below the surface or uh, 10 or 100 meters below the surface and so it's a little deceiving and, and doesn't help our cause the slide or the image on the right is actually a clear example. You can see that at the where the trees and the wellhead and the surface equipment and the farmer's uh, property is on the surface. Then you, we go through between three and and 500 meters of, of of sediments, of which you can. What's highlighted in blue is the potable water zones. That's the water that you can drink. And then you go through another, in this case, 1,400 to 1,600 meters of sediment before we get down to the zone we're actually fracturing. And that is where, so you've got a long ways to go between where you're actually fracturing your oil and gas reservoir and the surface. And you can see from this, uh, that photo on the right that it is very far away from the, the potable water zones. 
Now that I've covered some of the background issues uh, specifically to do with the public concern over induced seismicity and invaded potable water, I'm now going to introduce the decision analysis approach. In this uh, analysis, we will identify induced seismicity concerns, we'll determine the area characteristics of the treatment well, and we'll analyze for potential induced seismicity or invasion in your particular project area. So we've already covered the other pieces, and then we're going to roll into when you, when you do the analysis, what you should do, and that is to inform your stakeholders as, as required, and then proceed with a monitor or non-monitored situation depending on how you've come and the information to determine from that checklist. So let's go with induced seismicity concerns. What is your project scope? Are you wastewater injecting or are you hydraulic fracturing? Wastewater injection involves in injecting a lot of fluid or water into uh, injection wells for disposal. And it could be a lot of fluid over a long period of time, and that can create induced seismicity. If you're looking in, into just hydraulically fracturing a, a new well, that will involve a short period of, of a lot of pressure and fluid, and that will create a different type of circumstances that you need to pay attention to. The, the, and on, layered on top of that, what are the government re regulations in the area you're working? Do they have regulations that say you need to monitor or not to monitor? Now, let's talk about the geology. Now that you've got general where you're going, are the government regulations, but now what's the geology? What is the basic groundwater? Do you, do you know that? Can you get that from government regulations? How close are you to Precambrian basement? Is your reservoir overpressured or underpressured? Or is it depleted? Are there existing faults in the area that you are aware of? Additionally, let's go to the next topic, which is your hydraulic fracture treatment style. What is your hydraulic fracture pumping rate? What is the fracture volume or fluid rate or fluid over time? These are important issues that you need to review to determine whether you need to hydraulic for, or whether you need to monitor or not to monitor. The next part of the checklist is induced seismicity concerns. You need to check with your, your company's projects, your company's operations, or what could be in the published uh, domain. Is there pre-existing seismicity? This would be natural or induced. Natural would be earthquakes that occur due to the planet uh, activity. Induced would be earth, uh, earthquakes or seismicity due to mining or even oil and gas. You could be able to determine that in an area. If there hasn't been any induced, uh, any natural or induced uh, activity, then you're probably safe. You don't need to monitor. Also, in your company's archives or uh, what's been published, are there recorded micro seismic events? Do the events get that high? Uh, if they're not that high, if they're mag 2 or lower or 1, depending on the government regulations, you may not need to monitor. But you still need to pay attention to areas that the public is sensitive to. This could be to critical control structures such as a dam, uh, schools, populated areas, and then please check the government regulations. You may need to require, be required to monitor uh, because of these situations, and that helps to support your public license to operate. And supporting calibration, you're going to look at everything you've done and once you've looked at it, you go, well, if we had this information, it might help us in our story when dealing with the public in the future. That's what I call supporting calibration. You're going to monitor in these sensitive areas. So if a concern comes up, you can say, no, we did monitor uh, because we were concerned about the environment in this area and this is the results we have. Now I'm going to review a decision tree analysis checklist. In this checklist, I've identified three or four categories that you can put into an Excel spreadsheet and indicate with a check, yes or no, or something you need to pay attention to as you go forward. So I'm going to roll through these three or four topics uh, once again. So in your project area, where's your well location going to be? Are there government regulations in that area that you need to pay attention to? What is the depth of potable water? And is this a wastewater injection project or is it hydraulic fracturing? On the next part of the ch checklist, next bigger topic, the geological concerns. These are things that your geologist can help you with. Or if you're the geologist, these are the things you can you answer those questions. Are there any map faults in your project area? Are there, is there any pre-existing seismicity that you can determine through either government rec uh, records or in your own company records? How close is your well that you're going to frack close to Precambrian basement? If it's greater than 600 meters or greater than 300 meters, you will probably not have a problem with hydraulic fracturing and creating induced seismicity. Anything close to that, you have a chance to create uh, induced seismicity in, in, through your well, well bore or well field activity. 
What's the reservoir pressure? Is it high pressure? What's your frac gradient? If it's really high, that will probably could induce seismicity. Again, what if what if your company has done in the past, or uh, or what is in the government regulations in terms of what other people have done in the past? Is there a cap rock issue on the reservoir you're chasing, especially if you're dealing with some projects uh, such as in Canada or oil sands where your cap rock is critical and it's the actual seal to your reservoir? If you do have this issue, you may need to monitor to make sure your cap rock integrity is maintained. What is the maximum stress direction? That has an impact on how your fracture will, how your fracture wings will go and perform. Now let's go into the other activity. This will involve you chatting with your engineer. What is going to be your hydraulic fracture uh, pump rate? What is your hydraulic fracture stage volume? The higher the pump rate, the more uh, fluid and, and uh, propant you're going to put into your reservoir will actually impact whether you you should be uh, doing a hydraulic fracture monitoring. And have you done any microseismic through previous uh, hydraulic fracture operations? What is the magnitude of those events? Are they, are they below zero? Are they minus ones, minus twos, as a lot of operations are? Or are you in an area that is actually creating some higher magnitude events and getting greater than a two plus two or plus three? You need to look at that to see and talk to your reservoir and completion engineer to figure out could you or should you be monitoring to pay attention to what could be happening with your hydraulic fracture treatment. Lastly, in the area you're working and to address uh, government issues is, you know, I call it a sensitive public area. And, you know, is it a, you're near a park, you're near a school, you're near a populated area, or you're out near a critical control structure such as a dam. You may wish to monitor so that it protects your social license to operate. And what it basically comes down to, once you've done all this, is no monitoring required or should you monitor with protocols? So this slide here sort of encapsulates all the items into one, one view, with the bottom being no monitoring required, uh, monitoring with protocols. You can either use it in this form with, uh, or put it into a spreadsheet and a checklist uh, that checks off yes or no. Now I'm going to give you two examples in, in uh, Western Canada that will illustrate the points I made with all the topics I've addressed in the earlier part of this presentation. One will be come from the Horn River Formation up in the Horn River Basin in Northeast BC, and the other is going to be from the Bakken Formation in a province we call Saskatchewan, in, also in Western Canada. Now, when I show you the decision tree answers, when you see green, I firmly believe that you can proceed with no need to monitor. If it's orange, it's okay on its own, but not enough to monitor for induced seismicity monitoring. But if there's many of them you might want to consider doing induced seismicity monitoring. If it's red, well, if it's just one on its own, you might want to consider doing induced seismicity monitoring. But if there's many, uh, you might want to have induced seismicity monitoring with a traffic light protocol in place. So let's go to the Horn River, uh, Horn River Formation. It's the Horn River area, Northeast BC. First topic, most important, how close are you to the base of the potable water? In this area, they're well below, they're about 500 meters below the base of potable water, and they're involved in hydraulic fracturing. I'm not, we're involved in hydraulic fracturing, not wastewater injection. So, okay, we're going to proceed along oil field activity in that manner. Is there pre-existing seismicity? Yes, there is. It's been recorded on the NRCAN grid and through a lot of other uh, activities and has been published in a number of papers uh, and in the government with the government regulator. Hmm, got to pay attention to that. Is it proximity to a pre-Cambrian basement? Well, it's between two and 500 meters, so I put that as an orange. It could have an impact, but probably doesn't. Uh, but you need to pay attention to it. Reservoir pressure. This is the big one. It's highly overpressured. You're looking at 42 to 48 MPA. The frac gradient in this area is over 21 MPA per, per meter, which is very high. Is there faults? Yes, there are, and they've mapped them. On the next category. So, how are they going to frac this? Well, the, they fracture these wet reservoirs at 7 to 20 cubes per minute. That's pretty high. It's not super, super high, but it's really high. So, I put that as an orange, uh, and the volumes are high, but you can even get in higher. But you put 100 to 450 tons per stage. That's a lot of fluid to be uh, stuffing into an, a hydraulic fracture. Yeah, you might want to pay attention to this. But have they recorded microseismic? Yes, they have. They've events above 4.3. They are definitely you're going to need. They have monitored. You're going to need to monitor. And it, it turns out the government is saying if you work in this area up in this neck of the woods, you do need to monitor. 
Is it a sensitive public area? No, it's in the boonies of uh, Northeast BC and Canada. That's not a problem. However, all those issues together, you should monitor and you should have a traffic light protocol system in place. What I mean by a traffic light protocol system is you should have a series of stages of what your company would do if you're going to encounter higher magnitude events. And that would be staged. It's called a traffic light because when it's uh, orange or if it's green, it's probably under a mag two. Nothing is critical going to happen. Once you pass a mag two event, then it goes to the, uh, an orange state. And between a two mag two two and a mag two four, then you would have to identify, typically with the government regulator, what are you going to do if you exceed a three or if you exceed a four. And a, a red, once you exceed a four, is usually shut down your operations until you can inform the regulator how you're going to prevent any further magnitude events greater than a four occurring. Now well, let's go over to the, the Bakken Formation in Southeast Saskatchewan. It's well over a thousand meters below the base of potable water, and we're going to be involved in hydraulic fracturing. Is there pre-existing seismicity? No, there's not. I haven't seen any in the in the records or in anything I've observed in, in the government domain. Closeness to Precambrian Basement. We're about 1,500 meters above Precambrian Basement. Not a problem. Reservoir pressure. It's uh, normally, it's slightly at nor under normal pressure. 14 MPA, frac rating of under 10 MPA per meter. Not a problem. Map faults. Yes, near salt collapse features, you need to pay attention to, to those more for your drilling operations and less from the seismicity point of view. The hydraulic fracturing, because of the potential for bringing in water from above or water from below, and this would be salt water from other formations, the frac rates are typically low at three meters cubed per meter. Very low, not gonna be a problem. Hydraulic fracture volume, very low again, 18 meters cubed per stage, not gonna be a problem. Microseismic events, they have been recorded, they're usually less than minus two. That's a minus two, not a plus two. Now, if you are in an area near a dam, then you should consider monitoring because it's a sensitive public area. Otherwise, you, there would be no need to monitor. So in this case, the conclusion is monitor in areas of public concern, or if you want to get some background on the projects you're doing so that you can support and continue your, your public license to operate in that area. So let's do a summary of this. What I showed you, if you're going to do, go through the decision tree analysis, review your area characteristics. What is your oil field activity? Is, has there been any induced seismicity in the past? So there's low probability, you can probably save your company some money and you don't need to monitor. But if induced seismicity events are known, review the checklist, go through all those details. Bottom line is, if you're in an area of public sensitivity, you should monitor and have a traffic protocol system in place. So if something happens, you can explain to the public what you did, why you did it, and how you were going to proceed if things get, get higher. It actually will increase the trust and understanding between your company and the general public. So bottom line, keep calm, consider monitoring, have your protocols in place, and everything is there, frack on. Thank you for your time.